Psalm 2, why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now that's exactly where we are living today. Rulers and leaders are taking counsel together. The counsel, the direction they're heading in is against Christ and against those who are called by his name. And they're saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So here's what we are facing today. We're facing a godlessness that has gotten into some measure. It's never an ultimate authority because God's an ultimate authority. But this godlessness has gotten a hold of many in leadership positions, whether it's in corporations or schools or government, wherever it is. And the ultimate goal is to take away the restrictions on behavior that the presence of God implies in society, in people, in families, in homes. You know, the Word of God says that we should not fornicate. And all fornicators, they don't belong in the kingdom of God. The Word of God calls adultery sin, a sin that brings a stain that just doesn't go away. And you, you know, I can just go on and on. The, the, the scripture says that no, no thief will inherit the kingdom of God. I mean, we go on. They don't want these restrictions on their behavior. So the result is that they get together and say, let's impose a new world order. Let's impose a new value system on this society and let's break the bonds that these people who say they know God have placed on our society that have restricted our behaviors. Let's call evil good and let's turn around and call good evil. And this is where we're living today. This is the day that we are going into. Now listen to God's response to this. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. In other words, he, he will let them go into confusion. And who can debate but that we are in confusion in America today? There seems to be confusion at almost every level in society right now. There's, I don't think there's any debating that. I see the hand of God in the confusion that America has now experienced, the shame of face that we're now experiencing. He shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. So God's already on the move and he's already saying, I'm not going to let this prosper. Yes, they will raise their voice and yes, they will stand against the people of God and yes, they will try to cast away all cords that the Word of God puts on human behavior. But God says, I'm going to confuse them, I'm going to confound them, and then I'm going to start speaking to them in my displeasure. I don't fully understand what all of that is going to look like, but I'll tell you one thing, I would not want to be in the position of God speaking to me in his displeasure. He has the power to cast into outer darkness, you understand, he has the power to bring a judicial blindness even on governments. His speech cannot be contravened, nobody can stand against the Word of God. When he speaks, it must be done. Now, the rest of this psalm speaks about Christ. It speaks about God's response to this. It speaks about a Messiah. So, but as the body of Christ, we are the co-inheritors as it is because we sit with him in heavenly places at the right hand of God. He is the head, we are the body. So we, in a sense, and I wanna look at it in that context, become co-inheritors of what God speaks that he's going to do through his son. So let's take a look at these verses. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. So this is the first thing that I believe that you and I need to do if we're gonna make a difference in this generation. I've already spoken about that. In other words, we are determined in our heart there's gonna be one king in my life. There's gonna be one voice that speaks. There's one path, there's one direction, there's one place I'm gonna go. As Christ obeyed his father, knowing he was born to die, as Christ obeyed his father, and even in the Garden of Gethsemane, even though he did not want to do the thing he was called to do, yet in obedience to his father, he said, not my will, but thine. And I wanna challenge you that in this year that you set Jesus in the proper place in your heart and in your life, you are my king. You have the right to my life. You purchased me with your blood. You are truth. All truth is found in you. The purpose of my life will only be found when I begin to acknowledge you, not just as Savior, but as Lord of my life. As Lord of my life. God, help me to yield the reins of my life. Help me, my God, to, to give up my own plans and dreams and ambitions. Help me not to fall into the trap of trying to refashion you into a God that I find suitable for my future. You have a future for me. And, and I'll tell you straight up, most everybody here, if not all, you don't know what that future is. None of us do. Only God knows, and we'll never get to where we need to go if he's not the king. He has to have the right to speak into our hearts. We go to our knees 
knees one night we, or we sit on the edge of our bed and we just, we think we're having our just our regular devotions and suddenly just something from God, something of heaven drops into our soul, a country, a culture, a people, a purpose, a meaning, something you never considered before. God drops it into your soul because that is his will for your life. I had a, a young actress one time come to Christ at Times Square Church and she was so excited. She was a front row Christian. She was dancing and jumping up and down and I, she would come to me after most every service and say, I, it's so exciting. I found God. I found Christ as my Savior. I've been looking for this all of my life. And then I noticed over time she started kind of sliding back, third row, fourth row. And then one a Sunday after service, she came to me. She said, God, he can't possibly be asking me to do this. I said, asking you to do what? She said, to give up my acting career. It's been my dream. It's been my passion since I was a child. It's been all I've ever loved and longed for and wanted to do. And he can't be possibly asking me to do this. Tell me, she said to me, that he's not asking me to do this. I said, I can't tell you that. I can't tell you he's not asking you to do that because only you know for sure what God is asking. But I can tell you that if he is asking you to give up something, he has something better for your life. He has something that he's destined for your life. And, and she, I remember the last time I spoke to her, she looked at me and she said, after I had shared this with her, she said, no, it can't be. That he's asked, she, she was willing to embrace a Jesus that would enhance her acting career. She was not willing to embrace a Jesus that would ask her to give it up for another reason and for another purpose. And she eventually, the last time I saw her, she was at the back of the church. Then I never saw her again. She just disappeared, in a sense, back into the ocean that she had come from. She'd found the Savior, but she found a Savior that initially wasn't asking anything of her. And when he did, she backed up and backed away. And so my challenge to you this year is, is set your heart on this hill, this hill of Zion, which in type, in a sense, is Calvary. It's the cross. Set your heart there. We belong to him. He is the Savior. He has the rights. He has the plan. He knows what will bring fulfillment, not just to us, but through us for the sake of others. He knows the plan he has. He knew it before you even came to him. He foreknew you. He knew what he had destined you to do. And it's and most often, it's way out of the box of our thinking. I can speak that from experience. Most of what I've done all my life, I never thought I could ever do it. It was simply God, as I began to seek him, the doors began to open. So set your heart on the hill of Zion. Verse seven, he says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. I will declare the decree. This is point number two. He is my Lord, but I will agree with him as to what he speaks about me. I am, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Now, that would be blasphemous if it weren't true, if it weren't written in the Bible. In other words, I'm as clean as God is in Christ Jesus. So I'm not going to live my whole year listening to the voice of the condemner. Do you understand? I am done with the condemner. Jesus Christ is my king. His blood bought me. He has cleansed me. I am as righteous as God is through Jesus Christ. Yes, I struggle and yes, I fail. But every time I fall, he picks me up. He carries me forward because he has a divine plan for my life. And I am not going to live under the voice of the condemner. I am a child of God. I belong to Jesus Christ. Heaven is my home. My name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I will rule and reign with Christ for all of eternity. I will declare the decree. I will declare it. The devil can. He'll keep you under his condemning voice all year. And you'll become discouraged and you'll not grow and you'll not be able to hear from God because every day it'll just be pointing out you're, you only prayed for 58 minutes. It wasn't an hour. You said a nasty thing to that person. You weren't kind. You didn't give five dollars here. It will be all day. It will never end. But at some point we have to agree with God. I will declare the decree. I am who God says I am. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. In verse eight, he says, now ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. In John chapter 16, Jesus said to his own disciples, you haven't asked anything of me up to this point. Ask now. And he said, and you shall receive that your life might be full. You'll have joy. You will ask. You see, when, you, when Christ is your king and we recognize who we are in Christ, we understand we have a divine commission. Then we begin to ask for the things that God has determined to do through our lives. Hallelujah. And suddenly heaven begins to open. And suddenly he says, ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance, the ends of the earth for your possession. Ask of me. Ask of me. Think bigger than you've thought so far, thus far in your life. Don't put limits on God. Kick the sides out of that box that culture and time and family and even your own 
perception is put around you. Kick those sides down and say, God, I'm yours. You want to send me to India? Send me to India. Whatever you want to do through my life, God, do it through my life and help me to always go through every door. Ask of me, I'll give you the nations for your inheritance. Glory to God. Doesn't mean you're going to live in every place in the world. It means everywhere you go, there's going to be something of the kingdom of God born through your life. Verse nine, he says, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. In other words, God says, I am going to give you spiritual authority everywhere you go because you know who I am, you know who you are, you know the meaning of your life, you know your purpose. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ, and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Being ready to stand, being ready to go into the fire, being ready to say to any heathen king, if God can, God can deliver me if he wants to, but even if he doesn't, I trust him and I believe that there's a divine purpose to it. I'm not bending my knee to the gods of this generation, but I'm bringing the God of this universe into this situation. And I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna speak and I'm gonna stand and I'm gonna believe. As the scripture says, the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And those of you who know my history and the places throughout the world that God has sent me, you know this, in my life I know this to be true. I've been in places of war. I've been in places where I shouldn't be. I've been in places where the strongholds were so deep and so powerful but not, that nothing but the presence of God could bring them down. But I've lived long enough to see the scripture fulfilled. And it started in just the early years of just saying, Jesus, you are my king. And I'm not interested in the other Jesus of those who choose to take another path. Those who choose, they don't like the God of the Bible and they don't like the demands of the God of the Bible. So they try to take this Jesus apart as the children of Israel did when they came out of Egypt. And when the presence of the Lord through Moses seemed to be distant, they took the spoils in a sense that God had given them and they fashioned a God that they could see and a God that they could carry and a God that they could point and a God that they could lead. And I wanna tell you, humanity doesn't change. People come to Christ and are given giftings and they take the mind he's given them and they now start fashioning another Jesus. A Jesus that doesn't judge. A Jesus that doesn't send anybody to hell. A Jesus that demands no sanctification or holiness. It, you know, I could just go on and on. And we're seeing it in our generation on steroids now. But I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. This is where it begins. You, you have to put a stake in the ground. It's, it's, it's really that simple. I don't care how you do it, but say, this is where you become my king. I'm going to serve the real Christ. I'm gonna take the pathway of the real Christ. I'm gonna declare who I am through the real Christ. I'm going to start asking the real Christ for his purpose and will in my life. And I'm going to believe God for the power to make a difference in this generation. I'm not going to bow before this golden statue of this time and the theological apostasy of this present church age. I'm gonna stand and walk with Jesus. And I don't care if I'm hated. Let them call me what they want to call me. They called the master of the house Beelzebub. How much more of them of his household? That's what he said. So don't expect to be loved. But do expect that people will be born again and come into the kingdom of God. Do expect that through your life God will begin to do things that only he could do. I've been there. I've come home. <laughs> I'm just saying, you got to know. You got to walk it. You got to see it. You got you to take the chance. You got to go through the door. It's really just that simple.